City of Sevilla, a member of the faculty of the Global Law Program at ANU. She held, a, she held a chair on comparative public law at the European University Institute, and she has been working extensively on issues of gender and public law, and she will be in this panel our keynote speaker on her uh, most recently published book, uh, Gender Parity and Multicultural Feminism Towards a New Synthesis. Uh, I will uh, present now everybody, so we just go on. Uh, we have uh, also Pilar Domingo, a senior research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute and also affiliated to the Center on Law Essential on, and Social Transformation. She's an expert on many issues. I try to cut narrow, narrow them down on um, governance and institutional change, women's political empowerment, human, right, human rights and development, transitional justice, peace building and state building. Her region of expertise is Latin America. We have also Ellen Monstad, a PhD candidate at the Department of Comparative Politics at the University of Bergen. Her PhD thesis is part of the project Indigenous People and Governance in the Arctic and focuses on the influence of political structures in the realization of political power and authority for the indigenous population in the Arctic. Rachel Cedar, I'm not sure if I have to present you again, but uh, just, <laughs> no? Okay, so she's marvelous. Everybody uh, saw that uh, impressive lecture. I'm sorry for those who were not here. So, uh, and lastly, I present Irina Tiurikova. Is that good? A PhD candidate at the University of Bergen. She has an MA in political and social philosophy for, from Northern Arctic Uni Federal University in Russia. And she has been working on indigenous rights in Russia. So uh, we'll have, we'll have uh, uh, Ruth, uh, 10 minutes, and then all the other panelists will give her their own views on your talk. So... Uh Okay, so thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be at the Bergen Exchanges again. Um, I am always fascinated by this format of uh, horizontal, non-hierarchical, collaborative, fun, um, and lively way of exchanging ideas and stimulating each other. Today I have the opportunity to celebrate with you because it's always a celebratory moment. Um, this, this book called Gender Parity and Multicultural Feminism, it's a particularly nice occasion to be celebrating it because it's, first of all, it's the first time I'm actually uh, showing the, the child, but also because one of the founding mothers, um, <laughs> Rachel, uh, who was part of the, um, the workshop, and then the many rounds of comments of my, you know, insistent uh, editorial <laughs> way. I'm ultimately thanked for this, but it, I know it can be a bit... <laughs> is with us. So she can tell you as much about the book as I can. Now, in fact, in the program it says edited by me. It's actually edited by me and some minor scholar called Will Kimlicka. <laughs> <laughs> Very not known <laughs> in this domain, um, with whom I've had a long, a long friendship. And um, Kimlika, I was at the, at the UI at the time. Kimlika was going to spend some time. I had actually met Kimlika as a PhD student at the UI when I was doing my PhD and had kind of adopted him as, as a mentor. And so when I learned that he was coming back, I thought, well, how can we do something together? And I tell you this not just because I want to you know, publicly express gratitude for his mentoring and, and much generous teaching. He is an incredibly prolific and generous scholar, I have to say. But also because, in a way, it, it explains why the book came about. And the book basically... Um, so I am not an expert on indigenous rights per se. I am a constitutional law scholar, but I have for some time uh, taught... Uh, multiculturalism and constitutionalism, and there's always a section where I bring in the gender dimension. And typically the cases um, that we explore with students are, you know, the type of Lavelle, uh, Lovelace, Canada case, very old case, one in which uh, an indigenous woman is fighting 
for her sustained recognition as a member of the tribe because she's married someone outside of the tribe. You know, you have South African, fascinating South African cases in which the question is, um, you know, succession rights of women, especially often related to the fact that they did not live up when they married to customary traditions by way of marrying or that their children are illegitimate. Through custom, in, you know, through the lenses of customary law, so in a way, what you find is, you know, women who call on state courts to intervene when they feel that their rights have been not duly recognized within their own um, uh, form of law, and wh whatever the result is of these disputes, I always felt uh, a lot of uneasiness when I imagined actually how these things happen. So these are women who basically are not in agreement with norms. There are, tr there are norms of their community that have been mostly or exclusively be made by men reaching out to state institutions uh, for assistance. And when you look at those institutions and who it is that they're sitting on those courts and interpreting those constitutions, it's again, you know, courts made and shaped by men, uh, constitutions written by men. So it, it feels like, you know, at, at best, the hope is, you know, you see men negotiating with other men who gets to decide on women's lives and interests. So however wonderful the idea that you have, you know, constitution and universal rights, I always felt a deep frustration about this. Now, as you know, within the feminist um, uh, Know, political theory, there, there was this 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 idea, Susan Muller Oaken, that you know, in in a way, feminism and multiculturalism is uh, are hard to combine because ultimately, you're giving power to um, groups that the claim goes, have traditions that can be even more patriarchal. So it's a question of, you know, a race to the bottom in a way. Um, now to that, you had a response by so-called multicultural feminists who said, well, the answer is not to not to accommodate cultures. Women, you know, indigenous women, women belonging to religious minorities should not be asked to decide between their cultures and their rights. Um, they should have both. So in a way, the project should be more these multicultural feminists like Ayala Chahar uh, or Devo would say it's a question about how to ensure processes of internal transformation of the indigenous, religious, customary, tribal system of law and how to enhance women's voices, participation within those domains to make the necessary transformation, not unlike the processes with you know, state law, more generally speaking. Now, that was the multicultural debate um, I was, you know, I was coming to this at this point in my life um, from a different discussion, which is the gender parity, and this, hence the title of the book, the gender parity movement that is basically seeking, again, participation of women, uh, basically a participatory turn that I you know, locate around the mid-90s, Beijing platform of action, big world conferences, and women coming to the fore and saying, you know, rights is okay, but we actually want participation. You know, we've had suffrage rights now for a while. We're still, you know, 10, 15, 20% participation. We want to be sitting at the table, making the laws, judging, adjudicating. So basically, we don't want to be protected by the law. We actually want to create the world. And it seemed to me that these two movements were, in a way, talking about the same thing. But where are they talking to each other? Where both a theorist theorizing gender quotas, for instance, which is the main expression of this participatory shift, the worldwide explosion of gender quotas, mostly in the legislative domain, but increasingly also in the executive and the judiciary, in corporate governance, in sports federation, so basically decision-making and power sites and women claiming a right to be 50-50 parity, or at least a threshold, but meaningfully present with voice, where both the politics and the theory behind these movements talking to each other, because in a way it seemed to me that we're talking about exactly the same thing. 
they were challenging, you know, patriarchal forms of construction of the norms of the game. And Will Kimlicka and I found that they were not. That in a way, you know, multicultural feminists were having their discussions within multiculturalism, uh, minority rights, indigenous rights, but were not necessarily engaging with this other participatory shift and the quotas explosion and, and all of that. And politically, with some exceptions, I think Rachel can, can assess to that, especially in, you know, in the Andean region, Bolivia and Ecuador, where recent constitution-making projects had brought to the fore both you know, increased uh, participation on the side of indigenous women, but also feminist claims of new forms of structuring constitutions. But with very a few exceptions, you, see, you know, you could see that the politics, not surprisingly, <laughs> were not coalescing. So it, w it wasn't. So we actually um, decided to um, invite different scholars. The idea is let's pick um, uh, systems where you have legal pluralism, not only uh, deriving from indigenous law, but also uh, tribal law, customary law, religious law. And let's ask ourselves three questions. One is, do we find expressions of uh, claims that uh, more and more insist on um, uh, participation, voice, agency, as opposed to just rights protection in those sites? Um, if so, is the normative, are the normative basis on which those claims are being presented, which in the mainstream state institutions, think of the quotas debates, you know, these, these normative claims usually take the form of, you know, substantive equality, but also democratic theory, either um, along a pluralism and enhanced pluralism, or along a line of disentrenchment of, of separate spheres division, are those the same normative claims that are being reproduced in those sites of norm creation um, that, you know, com that uh, coexist with legal pluralism, or are they different? You know, autochthonous forms of normative sources for claiming more voice and agency. And thirdly, what are the forms of institutional expression of these, of these um, um, uh, manifestations. So obviously it's not quotas, but other, other forms in which, you know, women in these orders are claiming, you know, voice and agency in creating the norms. It seemed to me basically that the, the very claim, given that cultures are, you know, complex and changing and adaptable, it seemed to me that the very claim that, you know, a certain culture deserves a form of protection and should shape a system of rights rests on the fact that someone is defining what that culture is and ought to be. And so ontologically, it seemed to me that having parity in the decision should trump whatever conversation comes after as to whether it is legitimate or not to trump or limit women's rights or minorities within minorities' rights in order to protect that very culture. So that is what motivates um, the book. And um, again, we chose different regions of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, uh, we tried to get India, but failed terribly in, in finding that that's, it's a gap in the book, unfortunately. But I think that the, um, I'm not going to advance much of what comes out, but in a nutshell, um, yes, you can trace, you know, since the mid-90s, similar forms of um, proliferation of participatory claims and not just rights protection claims. Normative basis, that's much more complex right? Uh, of course, the global movement towards women's empowerment has had, has shaped many of these other forms of debate, but often you also find very uh, local anti-Western forms of legitimation of participation that call on traditions and not on just, you know, Western uh, machineries of rights and soft law. Um, and institutional um, forms, well, you know, it, we're basically starting to, ex to examine this. I would maybe just point to two. One is the appearance of nested quotas. So these are quotas, unfortunately, in those countries where you have quotas for ethnic minorities, you don't necessarily find women. 
coming in through those quotas. Similarly, in those countries where you have gender quotas, you don't necessarily find minority women occupying those positions. So some countries are now experimenting with nested quotas to make sure that you know, one form of quota is nested within the other. Uh, but also some constitutional references, I'm mentioning Mexico and I'm mentioning Ecuador, which now when they sanction indigenous jurisdiction pay or at least mention the importance to have women's voices um, be, uh, you know, represented in either selecting the leadership or decision making themselves. So I think this is, this is what I want to say because I know you all have much more to say and I hope you will not respond to this because this wasn't a lecture. It was just a book launch with some ideas, but you will you know, probably want to share your own ideas on, on this question. Thank you. That one works, that one doesn't okay. work. Um, okay, is that better? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, congratulations to Ruth, mainly to Ruth, and to Will, um, for the publication of the book. And uh, I was delighted to be invited to the fantastic conference that they put together in Florence um, in a while ago now, yeah, um, for this. Anyway, and uh, I should also say that the paper that I have in this book, I co-wrote uh, with a former PhD student of mine, Anna Barrera, um, who worked on, on these questions in the Andes for her PhD research. So I want to preface everything by saying what, what I'm going to say now. It also came out of that um, collaboration, which... Ruth uh, occasioned uh, in, this, uh, in this instance, so it was great. What we tried to do in the chapter that we wrote for the volume um, was look at indigenous women's inroads in the ways in which they're demanding greater gender justice, but plural forms of understanding gender justice um, within their own uh, systems of customary law, uh, indigenous law, in um, three Andean countries, and those three Andean countries have achieved constitutionally a degree of recognition of legal pluralism, right? So we were kind of looking at the, the interface between, um, as, as Ruth said, the, the macro changes and kind of the organizational strategies and languages. And it came out of a long tradition of work that we would both, I think, situate ourselves within that questions these um, and there's no one frame, but questions hegemonic, liberal, feminist discourses about women's rights and draws very much on various um, schools of post-colonial feminist, decolonial feminist, feminist and intersectional analyses. So there's uh, the, the kind of the, the, we're having that debate with the multicultural theorists um, that I'll say a little bit more about, but through that. Um, so really we're interested... Um, as anthropologists in looking at different situated ways of contesting patriarchy um, and at uh, how you incorporate an intersectional analysis, right? race, class, gender, etc., cetera, um, and the ways that intersectional forms of discrimination affect the possible, a possibility of broader alliances for women's rights or gender justice. And I put that in inverted commas because I think it's an empirical question, right? It's not a given what women's uh, rights, interests, claims are in a given context. I mean, of course, we would reject that older literature of Moller, Okin, culture is bad for women um, for exactly the reasons that y you, you point to, that you can't reify culture, that's never hegemonic, uh, but also that, you know, our experience is that um, while patriarchy discriminates against women in all forums, um, actually indigenous customary justice is more accessible for uh, women for reasons of distance, cost, cultural proximity, and because they don't have to put up with the forms of intersected racism and patriarchy and class discrimination that they do in state justice systems when they are being judged by their male peers, however uh, disadvantaged they may be by the patriarchal pacts that often underpin um, those forms of uh, governance. Um, 
And we emphasize very much the need to look at the kind of strategies um, that uh, indigenous women are using themselves to improve their participation, the languages they use, the kinds of frames of claiming and uh, disputes. Um, we're also a bit worried about the fact that sometimes the literature, the multicultural literature on gender and minority rights tends to just kind of get rolled into the situations of indigenous people. So certainly at a theoretical level, um, you know, the, the questions about exit, voice, um, loyalty or acquiescence, um, they are present for indigenous peoples, but they're much more problematic, right? If you leave your community, um, and that means you lose your territory, you lose your identity, you may not be able to go back and see your family. I mean, and then you will, what happens to you once you are no longer within your, your communities is also, uh, as you know, a complicated question. So we argue that, you know, there are different, that, that looking at migrants to Canada is not the same as looking at indigenous peoples in Latin America and that though the, there is a lot of cross-pollination on the theory, we need to separate that out. And we review the ways that um, in Ecuador, Peru and Bolivia, um, indigenous women, organized indigenous women have made gains in greater political voice um, and taking part in these deliberations on norm making, um, both at national level, but within their communities uh, and their, their, their customary systems too. And that, you know, we underline uh, what we've done all of the way through working on gender and indigenous rights is that while there is, uh, going back to the questions in the previous panel, you know, obviously contestation, uh, conflict, uh, dispute within uh, indigenous communities around gender and many other things, um, the demand of indigenous women always is that their collective rights as indigenous peoples be respected and that it is not possible to res to for their rights at their at their gender rights to be separated right? and that's kind of where the intersectional analysis uh, comes back in so as Ruth said there have been these important windows of analysis around constitutional making but also around different legislative initiatives for example in Peru the law on uh, prior consultation um, and there are synergies um, between hegemonic feminists and, and indigenous decolonial feminists, but they're, they're really difficult conversations <laughs> always. And, uh, and sometimes the absence of kind of cross-class alliances, the racism um, that's inherent in those, the structuring of those conversations, um, and then things like kind of party political calculations and interests all mitigate against um, truly plurinational multicultural agendas for advancing women's interests. I'm gonna shut up, um, but the last thing I would say is about the language. Um, we argue very much you need context-specific approaches. In some places, women are using discourses about gender rights, quota, parity, and in others, they're talking in different languages about gender justice, and they may be talking about complementarity. Uh, they may be talking about family <coughs> right, um, rather than women and women's rights, and we need to be paying attention to those frames and those languages um, and um, for advancing different forms of gender justice. Um, I'm not sure that the language of gender equality is the one that is um, that gives political traction or even has resonance um, everywhere. Um, so um, the perceptions and the initiatives of, of, of the actors themselves, of the indigenous women themselves, have to be at the center of our analysis. So methodologically, we have to listen to people and take seriously the languages, uh, the, the framings that they're making um, for uh, gender justice. So we, we kind of conclude that quotas and parity uh, are important. And of course, they've been very important in Latin America, but they're not the only path to gender, um, to emancipation or gender justice. And uh, But that the, the vital thing is, of course, paying attention to the ways in which women and their male allies, I mean, that's the other kind of language, the other research finding from Anna's um, great uh, PhD, which she also published as a book, if you're interested in looking at that um, more with Routledge, um, is that it is impossible to advance um, 
gender justice claims unless for by the women unless you have allies from the men and the male leadership so um, looking at context at multiple sites at, at, at alliances is what we try and do in the book in the chapter in the in the wonderful book thank you thank you rachel let's go around so thank you thank you very much and i'll build on some of the things that rachel has said but maybe also suggest that we take the terrain of legal pluralism to um, identifying different layers of institutions. So we focus a lot in the huge, uh, um, the discussion about legal pluralism has changed dramatically from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, and so we're, co we're counterposing state law, um, custom, so not just indigenous conceptions, but customary, religious, alternative forms of imagining governance, imagining decision-making, imagining rules of how power and resources should be distributed. But there's still here, we're still talking about legible narratives of what should be, legible narratives of social justice, plural as they may be, mm -hmm. contested as they may be. And I'd like to bring into this another layer of the more invisible ways in which power is exercised. The praxis beyond the normative standards, whatever they are against which we hold pra practice to account, just really understanding what that practice looks like and trying to identify the real ways in which decisions get made, who benefits from those decisions and who is part of those decisions. So in the, in the feminist um, literature on political empowerment, the focus has been a lot on getting people, women to the table. Increasingly, we're also looking at real access to those more invisible sites of decision making that are not dominated even by the question of quotas. Mm -hmm. how, you know, how you legislate for quotas in those spaces is impossible, but it's that space of, in, of informal institutions and how they, they are gendered <laughs> and how women or feminist activism needs to navigate and contest those. So I think that's... Lately, I'm very taken by um, feminist institution, institutionalism, which is trying to capture some of these more invisible ways in which power is exercised. And capturing there also, therefore, what processes of contestation of inequalities and domination, what they look like and, and how we can capture those. And I think some of the feminist analysis of contesting those is creating some very exciting um, empirical work on mm -hmm. on what um, what that looks like, and there, that takes me, and I'll be very brief here because we want to get through, to something that was raised in the previous panel, which is unpacking those processes of contestation and how agency is constructed and what resources can be invoked and drawn on and strategically mobilised in that process of exercising voice and agency. Um, in contesting these real ways in which these real rules of the game, however they may be defined or not normatively. And so I think they're the kind of questions that the research is increasingly taking us through. And it was great to hear this morning mm -hmm. some of the examples of that in ongoing research that's going on is about what does institutional innovation look like, including in those spaces of, of informal institutions? Um, but also in ways that accept cultural diversity, that accept the reality of legal pluralism, because that reality is not going to go away, however much, well, luckily it's already accepted that legal pluralism is the norm. But what does that agency look like? What kind of strategies for mobilization are invoked, ranging from using um, law in politically strategic ways, um, providing alternative legal narratives in politically strategic ways, but also navigating those informal institutions either to contest or change or challenge or, or be part of them. Maybe just accept what I need to do is just get into that space, into that bar where the men are sitting and, and making decisions, whatever the law says. So how, how are women navigating that? And does that look different across these legally plural spaces, these plurally legal spaces. Um, and what kind of capabilities are women invoking? What are, or 
gender activists, feminist activists, what are the, what are the kind of resources that they're drawing on for this? And a lot of it is about political skills. Mm -hmm. It's about political, um, the, the political skills and the, the capability of identifying strategic coalitions, even with your enemy. You might need to pay off your religious leader, mm -hmm. who's actually amenable to being paid off much more than his discourse would suggest. Mm -hmm. Um, but in order to change the social landscape of, of, of how institutions mm -hmm. look. Um, and then, of course, recognizing that gains are not necessarily cumulative. Mm -hmm. This is true, of course, of all battles of rights and normative change, but backlash is a reality and very violent backlash and by backlash in all kinds of ways where we're seeing a reaffirmation of patriarchy in very violent ways across much of the world, and also democratic backlash, which I think we'll be talking about um, later on today. Um, so yes, just to celebrate the fact that there is this very rich empirical work that's going on, and I think several PhD students here have mm -hmm. yeah. been quite innovative in, in taking these questions forward. Definitely. Yeah, thank you, Pilar. So I open the floor to Irina. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I'm particularly interested uh, in the issues that we are discussing here because, uh, of course, it's important to focus on the relation between indigenous people and the state and uh, fight for the rights of indigenous population. But I think it's also important to look at the problem of some potential conflicts and disagreement within indigenous communities because uh, it's mistaken to consider indigenous people as uh, homogeneous groups. Groups. And the question that I'm particularly interested in my research is the diversity within indigenous groups in Russia. Uh, and I think that the case that I'm studying, the case of Nanette's people in the northwest of Russia, uh, illustrates particularly how some groups might be discriminated or marginalized within indigenous communities. And here, uh, intersectionality as an analytical perspective shows uh, that it might be used as a very effective tool to voice to show these invisible groups. And as we said, intersectionality is not only about uh, gender, but this is also about class uh, differences. So uh, the situation with Nenets people uh, in Russian Federation is that uh, the law guarantees certain rights, collective rights to indigenous communities, but the question is who are these indigenous people? Whose rights are indigenous people's rights? And unfortunately, the existing system um, of law guarantees the rights to um, uh, the economic units, even though we used to consider rights as individual rights, the groups that are entitled uh, these rights are economic units. So the people who do not fit into these economic units, they stay a part of these groups and um, actually they get illegal status, especially when it comes to uh, the claim uh, to um, uh, land rights, use of land uh, uh, for reindeer herding. So, um, yeah, um, that might be an uh, uh, internal issue, but we should understand that uh, in certain situations, when, for example, it comes to the issue of the conflict uh, about land use, certain groups, they stay unprivileged and they cannot, um, uh, cannot go to the court and claim their rights, even though they're indigenous people. And according to the constitution, all indigenous people as individuals are granted certain rights. So, um, yeah, um, I think that um, this is only one example, but I think that this is very relevant to all indigenous populations all over the world. Thank you, Irina. Finally, Ellen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, my research is mostly on the um, Arctic indigenous peoples, which are in a somewhat different situation from quite a lot of other indigenous peoples in the world, uh, especially uh, realizing that they do tend to live in highly functional democratic states that have a tendency to actually want to give them rights. 
you know, logically at least. I mean, at least in uh, Norway, the Sami population in Norway live in a state which um, constantly scores very highly on the uh, HDI index and all sorts of other international index w- indexes where you know, the standard of living and the standard of uh, rights and power uh, is uh, measured. And so it's particularly fascinating, I think, to, to look at the uh, different roads to power in a situation that is like that. Uh, particularly in uh, countries such as, for instance, uh, Norway, you have the opportunity of uh, using what is known as uh, politics of embarrassment, which is a very catchy name, uh, where you are able to say uh, things such as, um, when it comes to ILO Convention 169, for instance, it's possible to go to Norway and say, you have signed this, you have worked to create it, you you are internationally arguing in favor of this, how can you then treat us in this particular manner? You should be doing this and use that uh, power to gain uh, rights for oneself as well. And when it comes to uh, the opportunities for uh, gender, uh, rights for gender and uh, the uh, the territory that comes with intersectionalism uh, in that regard, it's uh, it has the opportunity of uh, providing uh, certain rights uh, as women, for instance, you have a political minimum threshold of uh, 40% of each gender and when that is obtained, there is also the possibility of that right spilling over into other sections of society as well, so you can use sort of a ladder uh, with different steps that can be obtained. Uh, It's particularly interesting then to look at Uh, the Nordic states as compared to, for instance, Canada, where you have a completely different structure of things. So you have the opportunity of using uh, the uh, the difference between the unitary state, which you have in uh, the uh, Nordic countries, and the federal system, which you have in uh, in Canada, where it might be easier to obtain the rights in the federal system because then it's a shorter distance perceived to the uh, level of power that can grant rights. But then if you gain the rights in one state, you don't necessarily gain the rights in another state. So you have to do the same thing over and over and over again, uh, where certain groups can obtain rights and others do not. Whereas in, for instance, in Norway, you have a uh, longer perceived distance to the center of power. But then if you do gain a right, then everyone gets it. So if, for instance, you have a system like here, where you have a certain amount of uh, representation of women uh, in in government, then it spills over into the uh, other political systems, uh, such as the Sami parliament, and it's uh, it's there possible to uh, to sort of work through uh, uh, through other systems, uh, trying to find an increase in rights uh, in other places at the same time. So there's a spillover effect in that way, and it's it's quite a quite an interesting. Uh, topic for study when it comes to these kinds of things, uh, considering that the uh, political framework is somewhat unique, uh, being in such high-scoring democratic countries who constantly argue for human rights and for inclusiveness and for uh, representation and to see how it can actually be done uh, in a, in a context uh, like that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for all uh, your interventions. That was a lot of fresh air, as you said, to a, a paradigm that was uh, one that was putting the the situation as a paradox, as if we have to choose between uh, human Western liberal rights and and patriarchy. And I think here we have a whole new path and a whole new f- uh, field of research that has. Uh, that has a, a a long way, but I think uh, I think this is this was very very inspiring. Uh, thank you again. So I uh, will open the floor for questions. I think we have we can pick up some. Thais. Um hi. Uh, thank you very much for your panel. It was really uh, inspiring. Uh, I, it's really interesting. Actually, it's not a question, but maybe you would like to uh, elaborate on what I'll put in the table. Uh, I 
my work in Brazil is mainly uh, on feminist legal theory, so I'm really uh, go very deep into feminist literature. And I always, like as you said in your first talk, I'm, uh, struggle with multicultural, multiculturalism literature. And I have actually talked to Matt about this before. Uh, so I always have, like, whenever it comes to a multiculturalist uh, study, I'm always like, oh, okay, let's see, it's a little bit of prejudice on my end, but uh, it's something that, you know, we just have to have always in mind. But uh, actually, like, yesterday I had a, such, such a nice experience. Uh, I was talking to Eva, I don't know if she's here. She's there. Oh, she's there. And... Um, She's actually a representative of the Sami people. And uh, she was telling me that uh, in Sami uh, language, they, don't there is, they have a neutral language. So they don't use he or she. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started thinking, like, sometimes uh, even people that study intersectionality in multicultural, uh, multiculturalism are always uh, trying to see um, how patriarchy appears in uh, uh, other cultures. But I think it's really interesting to think about what other cultures can teach us, like uh, cap mostly like uh, Western and capitalistic societies about and liberal societies about uh, patriarchy and how it uh, appears. And I think it's actually, when we are inserted in this culture, it's really hard for you to take a breath and think about um, yourself. And uh, when you have access to other culture and other experiences, you start to uh, really go deep in your own issues. So, yes. Thank you. We have. So, hi, my name is Anzo. I'm from South Africa. Um, I was quite interested in a point being made around um, parity in the situation, uh, well, was situating discourses around patriarchy um, and, and this kind of rhetoric that in order to advance uh, women's rights or parity, um, that it is necessary to gain the alliance or the allegiance of men. Um, in the South African context, this has been tried uh, and has failed several times, <laughs> not just once. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I think that we've seen the world over. You say men are trash and then not all men. Uh, and I think that the call for these types of alliances is sometimes... Um, it's necessary to call for alliances, it's necessary to call for allyship, um, but I think sometimes it comes at the expense of those that are seeking such allyship. And so I wonder if there are perhaps... Uh, as I'm saying, I recognize the need for it in, in certain cases, but I wonder if there's perhaps a, a chain of thought that is thinking of an alternative. Uh, what if those that are oppressed, what if those are seeking kind of um, um, uh, some sort of relief uh, can move beyond the call for, um, you know, the, the person or, or the group that is dominating them to provide such kind of relief? <laughs> um, hi, my name is Maria. Um, I have a question concerning the politic or politic of embarrassment that you mentioned, um, mainly uh, connected not with indigenous people but with migrant population. And if you know anything that about this policy being used in Norway uh, concerning the migrant population or the um, second generation who were born here. Um, I don't know if you uh, you are in any discourse, but but it's something interesting for me because I'm uh, more into migration uh, studies. Um, but I never heard about uh, this politics of embarrassment. And for me, it, uh, when you mention that, it sounds more of like a Asian perspective. If I you, you understand what I mean, you know, like there's a lot of this um, shaming and embarrassment um, that you use uh, to maybe point out some problems in society. Um, if you can maybe talk about it a bit more. Anyone else? Okay, so we can come back here and we, uh, you were very disciplined, so we have we have time to to make another round. <laughs> that was very easy task to chair you. <laughs> so. Well, I mean maybe. 
So maybe picking up on, on your intervention and um, I guess two, two things is, um, so one of the, you know, so how to look at other systems also a source of inspiration and not just from the stand of uh, superiority and, and then helping, you know, the others get to our uh, conquered standards. Um, there was a, a vivid conversation, I don't know whether you remember, Rachel, um, around uh, Susan Williams' paper, because uh, part of the, of the claim we wanted to test is whether, um, whether to the extent that more participation and more agency was being claimed, that articulated a more or less universal um, criticism against the separation of spheres and you know women's allocation to the domestic sphere and 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 um in in her paper uh, Susan Williams well reminds us that you know that the separations of spheres was to a large extent um really entrenched with modern capitalism and wage labor and you know the the going away from the farm and shared household as a center of production. So in that way, to the extent that some of these cultures had not gone through that, uh, they could call on complementarity notions, as Rachel was a suggestion also, as something that indigenous peoples in, in the Andes do, that are not necessarily as loaded with the complementarity as separate spheres, i.e. women in the home. Now, we never sorted this one out because, <laughs> quite honestly, um, from my little ethnographic uh, um, experiments, but I have a few. I didn't tell you this. I, I did uh, spend some time in Bolivia and Quechua regions. And, and uh, you know, you still found the women mostly doing certain tasks at home and saying that these tasks at home were a big hurdle to their participation politically. So I still found whether or not they went through industrialization, I still found that it was the women taking care of the kids and doing, <laughs> and doing that. Um, and of course, awful patterns of domestic violence that are you know, universal. But I think that was an insight about how often we just assume and export our paradigms without realizing. The other thing that I found interesting is maybe not look as, as the other as a sort of inspiration, but for commonality. And um, I was just, I'm working now on a book on gender and constitutionalism, broadly speaking. And of course, if you look at the way citizenship theory, think of the classic Marshall, T.H. Marshall has been constructed and this idea that you have, you know, first civil rights, then political rights, then social rights, you, you know, from a feminist theory, it makes no sense because really the last rights to conquer is equality vis-a-vis -vis your husband. <laughs> so in a way, civil equality is the last bastion of, uh, for women. And when you, when you look at that and you realize that in spite of all, you know, the enlightenment, it was only after the 70s that women started conquering that specific form of equality, so after they had social rights and political rights. And when you look at the debates about whether customary and personal status law should be preserved or not, and when you look at the substance of this personal status law, and the laws, the civil laws, the family laws that were dominant in you know, Western Europe in the 60s, you know, there is actually a lot of commonality. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it's the same debate maybe happening in a different form, you know, Sharia law, complementarity. Mm -hmm. It is still much of it is this kind of family exceptionalism that kind of preserves you know, the control over women's sexual and reproductive and, and labor and, and care labor is kind of a male domain, kind of a state of nature that is exempt from, you know, whatever, you know, broader rationality is, is being claimed out there. And so I see very, very many links. So this is not Islam. This is not, you know, indigenous customs. This is, this is different forms of expression of the same phenomenon. So I am very interested in identifying those forms of commonalities that have 
uh, variations in terms of how they are expressed, but also huge similarities. And then you realize, yes, you know, there is a shared patriarchal culture that is shared, although it has different forms of expression, and that gives you a sense of humility when you realize that it's not culture doing it to them, but not to you. you know. So that's that's another interesting insight that, I, that I've had as a feminist reading these uh, sources. You think of Tunisia, you know, with the uh, um, Islamists coming to power and women getting on the streets to prevent complementarity principle to be entrenched in the constitution and replace equality. Uh, and, and basically claiming their, at the time, very advanced and reformed family code the Burgiva, you know, family code of the 60s, and saying, this is our constitution. This advanced family law is our constitution, and we're not, you know, going back. So, you know, that kind of resonates with debates that we've had in, in, in you know, in the Western world not so many years ago. So that's, that's where I find um, source of inspiration in identifying those kind of commonalities, yet, you know, yet coded in local idioms, languages, and struggles, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, can I just add one for you? Uh, we have this uh, famous debate, for example, between Moin and Lauter, and he was saying, he's like, Develop, he's saying uh, human, portraying the history of human rights as uh, uh, Western, uh, a Western value, etc. And then Slaughter answering, uh, you are hijacking human rights because if you look to local struggles, uh, you can see a lot of that going on. But uh, how do you see like your research being able to intervene in this very normative debate with like the, I, I feel I have the impression that uh, we have uh, specialized and uh, it, social sciences some branches are not always talking to each other and profiting the other branches research so I think there is a lot of in Brazil for example a lot of uh, struggle from the anthropologists to being to be heard by other branches of political science and sociologists, and there is we see a specialization and a difficult uh, conversation uh, between these areas. So, how do you try to make these cracks? <laughs> yeah, that's a it's a very good question, <laughs> yes. and it's a very difficult question. I mean, uh, you know, there are cross-disciplinary debates that are not really interested in engaging with the terms of construction of the other. Right. So, for example, we could think about cases where uh, the multiculturalism the, is bad for women's school would pick the ethnographic examples that will you know, mm -hmm. uh, bear out their case, but they're not really interested in the point that Ruth is making, which is the fundamental point, is that equality as a, as a language of political mobilization doesn't mean the same thing in all places at the same time, and that we need to look at the context, the language, how it's being deployed, that complementarity can mean one thing for one group, something completely different for another, so who is using the language, how are they using it, etc. There's just kind of basic points about ethnographic uh, inquiry, but um, we also need to take on board you know, the normative debates and seriously and engage with the legal philosophy, and that you know requires kind of levels of goodwill and engagement that are not always there. <laughs> let me say that. Um, and. And to come to the point of pacts with patriarchy, again, that's a question about context mm -hmm. and, and historical moment and possibility and about thinking kind of what are the multiple paths you know, of separate spheres as political spheres about how to avoid provoking... I mean, backlash is inevitable, but some forms of backlash are going to put you back many more years than others. And for me, about... I mean, the, the, this is on kind of the very micro scale of what we were looking at at community level of, and, and Anna's PhD was kind of on what works and what doesn't work in terms of improving conditions for combating violence against women. Mm -hmm. um, and she kind of went through the whole gamut of everything that NGOs do to try and, you know, combat violence against women and what works and what combination doesn't work. And, and the finding mm -hmm. uh, uh, that she had particularly was about that, that very fine-grained um, 
building of pacts with local male leadership, which didn't work always, but, um, but particularly interesting with some of the workshops that were done in Ecuador because it was um, activist investigation, um, but around intersectionality, about men understanding that the, the links between the violence that they were exerting on their families um, and the violence that they experienced at the hands of that historically had experienced as serfs on farms, right, and on peons on, uh, on, on the farms, and kind of making those connections as activists between different kinds of violence and the intersectionalities of violence. And, you know, it, this sounds great as a formula, and obviously it's hugely difficult for it to get taken up in practice, but... I think about some of the cases I've been involved with in Guatemala of um, mass rape of indigenous women during armed conflict, which is what Irma Lizzie was going to talk about because she, she's one of the key, she's been one of the key anthropological special expert witnesses in those cases. But the ways in which rape, which is badly dealt with in every single legal system, customary, statutory, the lot, um, um, how that became identified as a form of uh, injury against the indigenous peoples as a collective right? mm -hmm. and understanding the role of racism, of land dispossession in you know, facilitating the forms of systematic rape that went on as part of the armed conflict. So I think um, you're right. It, you know, and particularly at, at, at national level, I think those are very diff different sets of conversation, but how do you change understandings of, of violence right? and of particular forms of behavior um, at micro level? And I think it, for me, intersectionality and the kind of conversations that indigenous feminists in Latin America have had uh, building on intersectional theory um, are often very practical about kind of hands-on ways of building those alliances to try and, and change change behavior. So I think that that is important to, to look at that. You know, where where are where are we looking for for greater forms of security, right? Um, and 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 how can we build those alliances? And why can we not build those alliances in other cases? You know, those are kind of also important empirical um, questions about the forms that patriarchy, uh, the ways in which patriarchy is mobilized as forms of political capital. <laughs> um, just to echo this point about whether you, how, how and what these alliances should look like with men and do you need them or not. It's an empirical question, it's a strategic choice. History is made up of the no, we don't, we fight until we win, mm -hmm. versus the more reformist, okay, let's nudge our way forward. And that's across all kinds of rights battles or battles of redistributive battles. And so I think it's about building up our knowledge of what do these stories look like and what are the difficult choices that are made, but that take into account all kinds of changes going on both at the community, subnational level, the national, the global, and the kind of alliances that can be made across these, which may, which are not only about men and bringing in the men, but all kinds of strategic actors. And I'll just tell you the story of Tajikistan, and I'm not an expert on Tajikistan, but um, the reality that several things happening at the same time. On the one hand, Tajikistan, I learned recently, is the country that exports most male economic migrants to Russia and has huge um, inflows of, um, of money coming back from Rem remittances. Rem remittances. Mm -hmm. So what happens at the subnational level um, in Mus Muslim marriages that are, no, there's a now progressive law that says all uh, Gender equality is secured legally. Women's rights are fairly progressive. There's, if marriages are registered, then all, all those laws, protective laws of gender equality, get activated. But in reality, at some national level or in rural space, Muslim marriages are not registered. So the men move to Russia, then call their wives and say, 
and divorce them by phone. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you have women that are dispossessed with no evidence that, that the house they live in is theirs, that all these things that they had children. before, <laughs> children, all those things. So then the question was, okay, what we need to do is make sure that marriages get registered. You're not challenging the, the custom, from, you're not yeah. challenging religion, you're just creating a layer of protection mm -hmm. that is about mm, maybe bringing in those gatekeepers that are necessary. So who do you need to maybe persuade about the benefits of this? The religious leaders. Mm -hmm. To say when you, when you perform a religious marriage, can you also just make sure that you <laughs> list, write it down <laughs> in the <laughs> registry? And it's a small step, but it's one that adds protection, but also recognizes the pluralism of, of this context. And that's just a small example. Um, to this conversation, I would like maybe to bring up the topic of the political regime that exists in the countries and maybe to connect a little bit to the comment of Thais about uh, indigenous population, uh, that indigenous population also can teach us gender equality in a way, because uh, we also should take into consideration that the gender regimes that exist in uh, indigenous societies in lots of the cases are the product of colonization that happened before. And for example, in the situation of, Russian, of the Russian Federation, women are also displaced from tundra, from reindeer herding, and they fight for their rights. But they do not get such a support as, for example, men. Because most of the population, indigenous population themselves, they consider women uh, to be responsible for the household within the settlement, but not the tundra. And this is the heritage of the Soviet time, of the certain politics of assimilation that were, uh, that were um, implemented by the government towards this population. And uh, if we talk about the um, conversation between different actors, alliances, uh, we should also take into consideration the history and understand certain patterns, why certain alliances are possible and certain are not, and take into account the existing discourses to understand the problem. Do you want to add something? Yeah, so, uh, one minute? Yeah? Okay, uh, shortly. Uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, politics of embarrassment, as you asked me about, is uh, that you need someone who is, in fact, motivated by shame. And uh, when used uh, sparingly and wisely, then shame is a fabulous motivator. But you need, uh, in fact, to, to do it uh, in a way that resonates with the well, person or the institution or whatever that you want to use it with. Uh, such as, for instance, if you use it against the Norwegian state, you need to find a point where they want to be good, and then you tell them that, uh, but you're not good. You're constantly arguing that other people should be good, but you yourself is not good, and this is how you can be good. And um, so, I mean, specifically when it comes to migrants, I'm uh, not sure because that's not my field at all, unfortunately, but I can only imagine that many of the me mechanisms would be uh, quite similar. I mean, we see this uh, in, in all sorts of situations, that uh, your shame is used as a motivator for uh, large international corporations, for instance, and uh, the rights of all sorts of marginalized groups. And when it comes to other uh, factors, such as, say, you know, plastic waste and pollution and how to use better solutions than you are at present and how to... Uh, do all sorts of things, but it's important to use it with someone who wants to be, you know, uh, a good student, uh, who wants to actually obtain what you say that they are failing at. So thank you so much. Oh, you have one more question? Yeah, we have five minutes. So two, two less questions. Okay. So, hello, my name is Eva. Um, I come from the Center for Sami Studies at the University of Tromsø. Uh, it's more of a comment, actually. I just wanted to um, elaborate a little bit on the on Norway and Nor Norway, the Norwegian state's indigenous politics, just to not um, just only leave it as 
the best practice example <laughs> um, of indigenous politics internationally. I know, I guess your research is more complex uh, than that, but uh, um, I, I just wanted to, to say something about, um, I think we are now in this kind of a new wave uh, of resistance, um, seeing that in the Sami society after, uh, as you correctly mentioned, uh, um, the Sami has acquired a lot of, of rights uh, after the uprising happening in the 80s, a lot of constitutional uh, reforms and uh, uh, introduction of, of, of rights. Um, but also now, the, the last years, we have seen an increased pressure on, on land, which is causing this kind of also new uh, relationship with the state, uh, changing strategies and a lot of um, uh, the, the, um, the damage of trust uh, uh, that was beginning to, to, to be established between the Sami uh, community and the uh, Norwegian state. And I think that in, in relation to intersectionality, um, it has, in populist um, anti-Sami rights uh, discourse, been kind of used against us by talking about uh, indigene indigeneity as uh, equivalent with, with uh, lower class, like you, you need to be uh, socially and economically marginalized to be indigenous. So they're actually trying to start to, to argue that we are not indigenous uh, because we, uh, now, we are not um, uh, the marginalized poor in the community. And uh, I think that's a dangerous discourse because uh, actually I think that indigenous uh, politics and rights uh, should be about, uh, not be about uh, how to get out of poverty. And it is the situation for most uh, indigenous communities, but actually where we are at now is to really fight for our, our cultural rights to be different and to be different in, in any way, like to be self-determined within academia, to be self-determined, to be respected as a, a people uh, in the same line as, as, as other peoples and the majority society. So I think that um, is an important point. And also regarding um, Sami women's uh, uh, struggles today, um, it is actually a really uh, a special situation where indigenous or Sami women are really at the forefront in politics and in many important, uh, leading important organizations. But that doesn't mean that uh, there are gender struggles within the Sami community. And it's also a result of uh, the kind of... Uh, uh, Norwegianization of the traditional livelihoods, such as reindeer herding, many women has actually lost their their rights uh, to engage in reindeer herding because of how it has been integrated into management, uh, state management, and that pushes women actually to go out and, and take education and, and do this kind of political struggle. Uh, but at the same time, they are deprived of the traditional rights, which links them to, to, to Sami culture and community. And uh, of course, um, these kinds of internal um, discussions are, are always difficult to do within indigenous communities, because at one hand, you are negotiating collective rights, and on the other hand, you are collect negotiating this, um, these individual rights. So there are important struggles there also. Um, and uh, I would also mention the, um, the Sami queer movement, which is really rising up now. And the last few years has had like a really, really um, strong presence in, in, the, in the public debate about uh, uh, Sami rights. Um, so just to finish, like the, I think that the, um, the Sami reality, the experience uh, uh, of the Sami reality is, is much more severe than the Norwegian state pro projects. Uh, Sami reality, so um, uh, with all respect and recognition of, of the struggles that indigenous peoples do all over the world, uh, we are in a privileged position, but I think we can't leave the discussion there. We have to really uh, continue to struggle, and especially for the recognition of being a people um, in all levels of society equal to, to, to other people. So, yeah, I just wanted to, to add. Thank you, Eva. A last comment by Danieli. So, um, hello, my name is Danieli from FTV uh, Rio. And uh, it's actually a question to Pilar. Uh, Pilar, you were calling our attention to more invisible ways uh, where women are fighting for their uh, equality. 
Uh, and these, I, I would like to know more about these invisible forums that you were talking about, uh, and how are they different from the more formalized forums? Are they worse? Are they trickier, or are they surprisingly new and innovative? So that if you could give just um, something that you found about these invisible forums, that would be great. Fun. So, Pilar, you have the last word of the panel, and then we've, we close. I don't think they're new at all, and I think they're very diverse. And I, um, there's not any single characteristic about informal rules, but it, what I'm trying to describe are those spaces where decisions get made, which are not necessarily the ones that are articulated in law or in normative language about what any community says is the just way of, of governance, of dispute resolution. So for instance, in Myanmar, mm, there's growing expectations and narratives about gender equality and accessing positions of public office, political power. But the reality is that decisions at the subnational level are made in tea houses, and only men can go into the tea houses. By the time debate, you reach the space of public debate, actually the political deal has been struck. The rest is discourse but the negotiation has already happened. And that characterizes probably most political systems. <laughs> and academic ones. And, academic ones. <laughs> mm. and so then the question is, is one of your strategic choices trying to access those spaces and influencing them and how you would do that? Mm. And they look very differently and they exist at every level and in every space of our public and private Not lives, so yes. <laughs> so that, that was the only point, thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the panels. Thank you so much for the questions. And again, congratulations, Ruth, for the book. Mm -hmm. So let's go to have lunch. <laughs> I'll have panel. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm wrong, Greek. <laughs> I'm sorry.